Willkommen. Welcome. It is a great pleasure to be here today in order to draw the attention to something that is most important. The Hospital Liberty and uh, this event has given us the opportunity to meet people who have an influence on the current and future generation and for them to have the opportunity to have a good school education. A school education that is also focused on their well-being. The Danish ambassador Susanne Hüller Lund is here as well and I would like to give the floor to her. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here. Thank you. Thank you very much for this nice introduction. I am very pleased to meet you and the team of Empathy Make Schools and so many interested guests from politics and administration and schools. Welcome to all those who also follow us on the live stream. The interest for this event is great. And greetings to everyone at home. Children and youngsters spend a lot of time at schools. They make friendships, uh, their interest for music develops here. Schools, if everything goes well, can be places in which young people can discover their competences and develop them. Places in which they can learn courage and self-confidence in order to deal with the quite complicated world. But uh, rarely everything works well. The debates about the lack of personnel, stress and pressure are topics in Denmark but also here in Germany. The lockdown at the beginning of uh, the pandemic have put schools in front of big challenges. The question that is in the center of today's event seems to be more important than ever. What do we need to make schools a place of positive relationships? The German-Danish project Empathy Makes Schools has very convincing answers for this. Not everything has to go perfectly. The Danish family therapist, from whom we are going to hear today, said that the best parents in the world make 10 mistakes a day. To make fewer mistakes is neither possible nor something that should be aimed at. It is not decisive as pupil, director or teacher to not make mistakes. On the contrary, often an open communication is linked with mistakes and it can teach us lessons. A second answer is as following, empathy. What empathy means at schools the speakers will explain today, Helen Jensen and other speakers, we will discuss about this and in small exercises we're going to practice this. And I wish you a lot of uh, pleasure and ideas for your own professional or private life. Uh, whether as parents or in the administration or in politics. 
as embassy, we cannot imagine something better than organizing such a format, a German-Danish dialogue in which across borders and sectors we learn from each other and can think together. We would like to continue this exchange also after the seminar and therefore I would like to invite you to the reception in the Danish Embassy at 5 o'clock there. You can have some snacks and drinks and with those we can, as known, think better. So I would like to warmly thank the entire team from Empathy Makes School for the great cooperation and I would also like to thank our colleagues from Fellasus for the support in the organization of the event and I would like to thank all of you for coming here and for participating live as well. Thank you. Thank you, dear Susanne Hüdelund. It touched me very much that you also mentioned Jesper, my teacher. A very warm welcome to all of you. A warm welcome to the fellows and a warm welcome to all the online viewers. It is a great pleasure for me to have you here today. We have participants from education policy, from the conference of ministers of education from the Senate administration, from the school inspectorates, from universities, from teacher training, from foundations, and many universities and schools in Berlin and associations that share the interest, and also from the press. And our sponsors, of course, our scientific advisory board, and thank you for your contributions, our pedagogical advisory board, the speakers, the experimental schools, the control schools and the researchers and our members. So a very warm welcome to all of you. We have a very keen interest and that is the future of our children, the future of our world and the future in general. So we cannot know a lot about the future. All we can know is that there are many challenges for our children and they are those who will have the responsibility as adults in the future. They will need courage, creativity, empathy and compassion, not amongst each other, but also towards their environment. And therefore today's and future schools should be designed in such a way that schools support children in developing these characteristics and competencies. What matters is to find ways to meet these requirements in order to strengthen today's school and to give the school of the future a chance. Peter Hoek, Katinka Götze and later Birgitte Lund Nielsen. But the first three are our members of the Danish Association of Life Wisdom of Children that was established in 2007 and who addresses development implementation at schools and teacher training in Denmark and Europe, also as part of EU projects. The other members of the association are also present at today's reception. These are meditation teacher Hamili Ogertstetter, Professor Dr. Sten Hildebrand, and Mikael Stuport, who both uh, work on the development of education systems, and the journalist Anders Laugesen, who for many years has been addressing existential issues, primarily in broadcasts in the Danish radio. Two members are unfortunately not available who are very important and therefore I would like to mention them here because together they created the basis for our work. And this is Jesper Juhl who after long disease died in 2019 and many of you will know his work. We owe him great thanks that for his entire work for stressing out the importance of equal relationship, equitable and equal relationship, that he kept an eye on the fact that every encounter between humans is an encounter between two individuals 
between two subjects, no matter whether or not they are children. And this, that good knowledge of one's own personality is required in order to meet other persons with respect, empathy and presence. The other is Jess Bertelsen, Dr. Feel and meditation teacher who for more than 40 years has been working on the connection between mindfulness training and sustainable and presence, depth and authenticity in human relations. He published many books on these topics, including several ones that were translated into German and which are open here and laid out here at the book table. And this migrates together with us, so you have the opportunity to have a look at these books. He's also the founder of VEC Centers, a modern meditation center where self-development and meditation are taught in a non-dogmatic and uh, straightforward basis. For more than 40 years, he has been teaching adults and children in presence and cordiality. And I would like to thank both of them, and we are very happy and grateful to have such magnificent teachers among us. And now let's come to the practical information about this afternoon. Together with some project participants, I'm going to give you a short introduction into Empathy Makes School, and then my colleagues from the Danish Association and extraordinary Professor Birgitta Nielsen will shed light on further perspectives of this joint topic. And at the end of this afternoon, Dr. Corinna Aguilarat and Dr. Lukas Hermann will give you a short overview of the research that accompanies our project. It will be an afternoon with many gear shifts and you will have the opportunity to listen, to try out and to think. And around in the middle of the program there will be a short break but really a short break to wash your hands. So please return to your seats quickly. And during the reception to which the embassy invited us so kindly, you will have the opportunity for a longer exchange. Unfortunately, it was technically not possible to set up breakout rooms for the online participants. Maybe it's possible for the online participants simply to take a break and to relax while the others are exchanging, or to use the break for any other purpose. Unfortunately, we have space for just a few questions. Therefore, please be so kind to send your questions to the email address I'm going to show you in a moment. There it is. Over the next weeks, we will answer these questions in our blog and also give you personal answers to the senders. So a warm welcome to all of you. And now I I'm no longer the moderator and I change my role and for project manager, but I will change to and fro over the day and uh, it will be easier later than it just was for me now. So which abilities will be important in the future? This is our question here. And we also orientated our of says towards the OECD, which said in a 2015 report that our students and pupils to simply give them academic competencies. This will not be enough. Social and emotional competences, persistence, empathy, mindfulness and courage are necessary. That's nice to read for me because this corresponds to my experience and it's always nice if something is confirmed by research and practical experience. And there's also another nice quote so there are many studies regarding this socio social factor, social factors, but there wasn't a lot in the past, but one of the first was, I think it was in 2008 at Oslo University by Nordenbo and others, and he said, 
after a longer review. Do we really want to improve learning systems? Then we have to train teachers to establish good relations. And concrete qualities are crucial. What matters is to create tolerance, respect, interest and empathy for every single pupil. And this is a demanding claim. This is a lot. How is this possible? How can this be created? You will ask yourselves. But if we work in that direction, then it gets into a completely different mood in the classroom. This is what we experienced. And this is a different, not just feeling, it also a self-effectiveness. And that's OK. And to be great, to be a teacher, and that it's also a good development, a good place for development for pupils. And after this, after these results, and according to our experience, we set this up accordingly. And this means that our goals for this project that we are carrying out here, Empathy Makes School, together with several schools, we have three goals, and one is the entire specialists must be enabled to create a positive learning and development environment. This is characterized by positive relations and empathy. And this is really the entire group of specialists. If I say teachers, then I mean personnel at schools and at kindergartens, because this holistic view is extremely important to me. So this is our first goal. And the next is the well-being and the achievements of children and the well-being of teachers must be enhanced. This is also something that is important. It's not enough that it's good at school for children. It's also necessary that it's also good for the adults. So in elementary school, this is where a child goes six years, but a teacher or an educator goes there for, say, 40 years. So a certain health must be in this system in order to avoid that everything is difficult as a result of the work. That was our second goal. And the third and last is by researching we wanted to establish the efficiency of relation and competency and an integrated and holistic scientific concepts. These are the three simple goals. Because I'm a practitioner. I'm Henne Jensen, by the way. I, f I forgot to say, <laughs> I presented all the others. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> it's weird. I remembered almost everything. However, here we took a look at these programs here and the programs we had in Denmark and Europe. And we worked a lot on research. And it's not because I know a lot about it. In fact, I don't know much about it. But it's totally important to look at this. What must we know for these research results? And for example, Birgit Lonelsen informed me this is it, when it comes to implementation, it's not enough to have a good program. It must also be properly implemented. And if we initiate something, and if it is to be implemented and anchored, then we have three factors, research says, and that can make it difficult. And the first factor is fluctuation of personnel. So an integrated and holistic system at school, it's difficult to set up because there we have increasingly, uh, we have increasing fluctuation. And secondly, we do not have not enough support from management. So it's not enough to work with personnel or to work with pupils. We must also always address management, not only at schools, but also in the entire school system, where we have several levels of management. And this is another important factor. And the third is not enough time for further education, qualification, and planning. And this is also something which we consider to be very important, that we have time for everything. 
we set up our project in a way that it was possible to consider these three factors and to address these because from the very beginning we we had generous sponsors and support from the very beginning that gave us the opportunity to work with this program over a long time because it's not possible on an afternoon it is not implemented quickly this is something we will have to work on over longer periods of time and therefore and this it's many years ago that we began in 2019. We started with our project to go to the schools, to find schools, to find experimental and controlled schools, to talk to parents in the parents' conferences and parents' meetings were organized in order to explain what we want, in order to make it possible to obtain a qualified yes or no answer and we worked a lot with this and then starting january 2020 we started with the modules and our project will continue until 2025 and i think this is something very exciting of course we extended it by one year due to COVID. However, it's a long time and we try in view of this personal fluctuation which also exists in Berlin school because it's so difficult to get enough people who have the right education in order to go to the schools and kindergartens. And the three schools with which the experimental schools with which we are working, we divided the personnel into two cohorts so that it's possible for newly hired teachers to uh, take part and when we have completed cohort two in spring then we are planning uh, how we can invite more new people whether it's possible to add new modules and whether those who were part of it uh, at the beginning that they can also take part if we continue working so I do not come from Denmark with a ready-made program. I come with many ideas and I come with things which I want to, which I want to um, adhere to and remain loyal to. So when it comes to implementing programs, we always have the question, so what can we adapt? What can we change so that it's right? for this place, for this school. And what do we have to continue? What do we have to stay loyal to? And it's always a question. And it's interesting to develop this together with the schools so that it's not just these many years. Every employee at school gets 80 and full days of teaching and this is divided into six modules, so three full days where the personnel attends our seminars and work together with us. Then we also have a program for um, headmasters and for principal. This is an ongoing program when we work here because this is also necessary that something is offered at all levels. And the last point I would like to mention, this is our parent-child afternoons or Saturdays, where the speakers and experts who work with us in this training and education programs can also work together with parents and children on an afternoon or Saturday where they offer all that which they also offer to our personnel. And in this way we try to um, go the entire way. And now I would like to invite Christine Ordnung here to me because she is the co-manager of our Empathy Make School projects and she's also my anchor here in Germany, I can say. And she's also a teacher. Uh, 
Ähm, ich habe nämlich die Gelegenheit gehabt, ich konnte bei Jesper Juhl und bei Helle Jensen meine Ausbildung machen. Uh, Helle Jensen war dann Kollegin im äh, Institut hier in Berlin in der Familientherapieausbildung und jetzt darf ich Co-Leitung bei diesem Projekt sein und das finde ich einfach großartig. Das ist eine so spannende und notwendige Arbeit. Vielen ja. Dank, liebe Helle. Danke dir. <lacht> ja. Und dieses Institut für Familien, das ist Deutsch-Dänisches Institut für Familientherapie. So da geht es auch, diese Deutsch-Dänische Kooperation. Und jetzt äh, will ich dich äh, bitten, Christine, kannst du bitte wechseln? Liegt es bei dir? Oder das ist da oben ein neuer PowerPoint? Das nächste, nur das nächste. Nee, wir, wir brauchen jetzt alle Beteiligten, diese schönen da, gelben Kugeln, genau. was vorhin schon mal Total, da war. Top. Genau. Danke. Ja, ich darf alle AkteurInnen und alle Gruppen, die beteiligt sind, an unserem Projekt vorstellen. Und äh, oben in der Mitte stehen unsere Förderer. Heute sind FördererInnen da. Äh, Helle hat es schon erwähnt, wir haben wirklich sehr großzügige FördererInnen, die uns das Projekt ermöglichen. Das ist einmal das AVE-Institut Engagement verbunden, äh, nein, Achtsamkeit, Verbundenheit und Engagement. Die sind leider nicht hier heute, aber wer hier ist und wo ich mich sehr freue, das sind Anna und Laura Figener von der ALV-Stiftung. Herzlichen Dank, euch kann ich hier sehen. Und eine private Stifterin wird noch erwähnt, die nicht namentlich genannt werden möchte. Darunter stehen die Schulen, die im Mittelpunkt stehen. Das sind unsere Experimentalschulen, die Brüder Grimm Grundschule, die Grundschule im Gutspark und die Sachsenwald Grundschule. Und daneben die, unsere Kontrollschulen und denen möchte ich heute unbedingt einen ganz, ganz großen äh, Dank aussprechen. Das ist die Wilhelm Hauf Grundschule die Grundschule im Moselviertel und die Schweizer Hofgrundschule. Ich weiß noch, wie ich in den Schulen mich vorgestellt habe und sagen musste, ähm, über fünf Jahre bitten wir euch, äh, die Erhebungsbögen auszufüllen. Äh, ihr Erwachsenen bitte einmal im Jahr, die Kinder bitte zweimal im Jahr, bis ihr in den Genuss kommt, das Programm auch zu kriegen. Es war nicht so einfach, erinnert so it was not very easy, I remember. Uh, we tried to do it during Christmas, but of course that was not sufficient. So I would like to thank everyone greatly and I would like to ask for an applause. Then we and then on the left hand side, we have the team that uh, was necessary to implement it. We have the project leadership and then we have the office. They are the contact point for everything. Rebecca Hinzmann and Mrs. Kriesel, thank you very much for your support. And then we have the speakers who teach together with Helle Jensen and me. They have an education in family therapy or empathy training. They are highly qualified and are educated further and introduced into practice so that they can support in the implementation of this project. And then, of course, public relations, which is also necessary. We have a home page and a blog. Thank you to both of you, Haladiz and Monakino. Thank you very much. And then we have the research and dear Helle, if I forget something, just let me know because research is not my main field. Important is here the University of Heidelberg, then the VIA University College in Aarhus, Brigitte has already been mentioned. And then we have some PhD students, master students and 
coordinators and interns. So a lot of people that are supporting us. And then we have the scientific advisory board and we have Nava Levit Binun from Israel and uh, founder of the Muna Institute. Then we have Meta Miriam Böll. I'll talk about her later more in detail. She has different tasks here. And then Anne-Louise Jungblatt, senior lecturer at the University of Göteborg in Sweden. And she is um, an expert in relational competencies. Then we have Katrin Wehr from the uh, University of Southampton in the UK and she is co-manager of the Mindfulness Initiative in the UK. Then I would like to continue with the Pedagogical Advisory Board. It's a long list. What is important to me here to mention is that Helle has developed a beautiful concept and we could say, great, we could implement this everywhere, but this is not how it works. The way we implement this program, how we get into touch with the directors of the school and colleagues is decisive. Every school has its own culture and uh, these cultures are connected into a school administration and also part of a culture of the federal state and of course we need to adjust to this culture as well. And the pedagogical advisory board helps us to support interest into our projects and to help us adjust and implement the project because we need to adjust to the possibilities here and it's different than in Denmark or different as compared to the Erasmus project that was implemented in four or five countries. So this exchange is the decisive part for the success of this project because otherwise uh, we just uh, work with three schools. It's a lot of fun and interesting and a lot happens but in order to spread it we need to get to know the pedagogical world and the administration in Berlin and uh, maybe this afternoon is one step forward into this direction. Okay, thank you. Okay, the slide can stay. Now you have an overview about uh, the details of the project and the different stakeholders. And what is very important to us is when we do something, and I've developed this program because uh, I've worked in this area for 40 years in Denmark, in Scandinavia, in Europe, and I've checked what is missing everywhere, where do we have shortcomings, especially when it comes to the education of teachers in order to have a, an environment in which students and pupils can develop. And I've learned a lot from a Swedish colleague. She always says, relaxed focus is the best starting point for learning. And I thought about my time at school. As a pupil, I was not always very relaxed and uh, that was true for other pupils as well. And I've thought about how difficult it is for pupils also nowadays. So we try to find out what we can to do with these tools. 
and uh, how can we teach the different tools to the teachers and what are the active ingredients of our program and it is great to have the support of research and it also is in harmonization with my own experiences so it was important to us to shape it in a way that is uh, adjusted to the pupils and we adults have to feel empathy with pupils we have to make sure that uh, adults and teachers can work with the children but still stay with themselves and this is what is important because development can only succeed through relationship so it's not just a relationship between two people if everyone just uh, focuses on themselves then there's no relationship and this is what happens when we are under pressure at work also at home many times we distance ourselves from ourselves and we've all experienced that when we work with children sometimes we are overwhelmed and then we don't have time for certain tasks and then I just distance myself and a situation escalates which if I felt better I could have handled better and this is what we work with we are trying to develop the competencies that are necessary to handle stressful situations. We have different exercises that we have developed. Peter Hook will introduce some of them. And we have also developed a dialogue as a tool that we are also practicing in our trainings so that we have active ingredients in different modules and through this we have different topics and contents so for four weeks I have taught traumas and sadness and it, it doesn't sound uh, very great uh, which is true but on the other hand it's um, very supportive we can see that we all have our tools and that we can work on our problems when we have the time and it is important to go into relationship with the children this is something that I cannot stress enough development can only succeed through relationships. I don't want to say much more because I don't have much time for it. There's a lot that we need to hear today and this is so much more interesting and it is great that uh, we were able to invite so many people here and to have the opportunity to organize such an afternoon. Now I would like to ask the participants of our Project Astrid, Brit Sommerfeld, um, Good Park Primary School teacher. I would like to ask them to the stage. Maybe you would like to take a chair. And Christian Wille, head of all day care Sachsenwald Primary School. And Ronke Oni Leo parents from the Brüder Grimm Primary School. Please come to the stage. Well, and it's only that we want to hear from you how it is to be in a project. It can be advantages, for example, Astrid as a principal. For you, how is it to take part? How is it for your school, for the school and for you personally as a manager, the pros and cons? So in order to give some more life to it than just listening to me, so, so please proceed a little bit so you're not glad. Well, 
it is very intensive. When we were asked, and I didn't use this picture for a long time because we are already in it for three years, we were told there is the apple of the paradise. At the same time, we knew how to get there because we knew that everything that is necessary for this, the circumstances and structures, are so difficult and tricky that we were afraid that we wouldn't be able to manage it. At the same time, we knew it, this is the only way to do it. This is precisely the right way. And we knew we had no choice. And at the same time, this is also the challenge. Because at school, what we can offer and achieve as a school is so wonderful and so rewarding. If you look at colleagues who look at, who come from further qualification programs, uh, how was it? And then you get this uh, empty smile, and then you know, okay, because it's not possible to express it in words. And then I tell to the parents and I tell them, teachers, who stand in front of the class, they learn so much during their training and during university studies. But what is most important is that teachers and educators, they are their own tool. And this, they do not really know this tool. And this applies to many social professions. And this also applies to teachers. And then parents used to nod. And they say, yes, they understand it. And they remember some teachers where they said, OK, that's it. And this is, in fact, of being at home with oneself. And the challenge, what is necessary, what would help, and how can a project be supported? And I think this was not. It was quite serious what I answered. What is necessary is time and space. And this is what makes it so difficult at school, because this is, in fact, lacking at school due to the structures. And we try to make this possible in our small microcosms to any extent possible. And I have to find out what comes from outside. And I must also know what can we get from outside. And you said you have Jesper in your head, and you are happy that this was learned here. And I said, I have Helge and Christina here sitting on my shoulders and in my brain, and therefore we will never stop tackling this challenge. And this is luck, and I wish that every school can work this way. Thank you, Astrid. And we can all you, you won't have the time at the reception. It would be nice to hear more from you, but unfortunately, not possible. But fortunately, other colleagues from that school will be here. So, Christian, would you like to continue? Christian, you are a principal of the Sachsenwald Elementary School, and the whole team of educators are part of Empathy Makes School. And we would like to know what is your benefit and what are the challenges. So please, two or three sentences from you, dear Christian. I see everyone, and everyone sees me, and that's good. Well, you said it. And you also said it. it's a major challenge, but it's also a step in the right direction. And we at Sachsenwald Grundschule, we have a complete school and educator team. Our janitor is part of the team. And this challenge, or to tackle this challenge and to accept it is a task, which was underestimated a little bit at the beginning. To have breath for five years, to have breath with the team, and in particular with a view to the full day education. This is difficult, and we see this again and again. If the colleagues, and I like all these colleagues, and after three days of further education, they smile at me, and afterwards we have to manage our everyday work. We have many people who are not, who are leaving, then this is eight or 10 colleagues, teachers and educators, who are not available in the morning. 
and they have a day off and we have educators on site um, who have to fill in for teachers who are not available but if we do not have colleagues in the afternoon then there's nobody to fill in because these colleagues attend further education courses and we also um, think it's good that they have it but it's difficult to take colleagues along with you this was one sentence and this is the big challenge but it is a pleasure and it is fun thank you and sorry for this it is my job now to urge you to keep on time thank you christian and what you said is of course also a topic at ems that means that educators and teachers must be connected to each other so brit or uh, who would like to continue Bonke? you are a parent representative who we could win over here you get the translation you attended a parent child afternoon and we would like to hear from you you're going to speak english so how was it for you as a mother to be in there and how did you experience and see your children there thank you very much for the opportunity it was a wonderful experience um, for the program i came with my two children and um there was a um, um, particular um, exercise we practiced together. We all sat down together, um, trying to converse on how the day went. And um, so one of us have to talk, the other person listen. It gave me an uh, opportunity to listen to what the person was saying. And I was able to feel what the person was feeling. And um, in that, I put myself in the other person's shoe, and I felt and I had compassion on that person. Um, another thing, we did some exercise together, and um, it makes me to be relaxed. There was no tension, and I felt relieved, and um, afterward, I believe that as a parent, I can not put that into practice when my children come home, and we like to dialogue. I give them listening hair, we do some exercise together, and we all relax, and we can rub mice together as parents, and um, as a mother and with the children. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Ronke. Thank you, Ronke. Ronke, thank you so much for this. It sounded like prepared, but it wasn't. This effect really happens. Now, Brit, maybe you would like to say a few words how you are working with the children at your school and you were also part of the modules. Good afternoon from my side. We were in the first cohort and together with educators and special pedagogists and all these people working at schools, we were together. We went through the modules and it was a strong gain of information. We were in some kind of bubble, and if somebody came back, and then we asked, are you Emst? And we said, yes, we are Emst now, and because these inputs, which Helle just mentioned, also um, this morning and loss, all this is integrated into input, into discussions, and into exercises that we did together, which were all voluntary. It's just an invitation. And we voluntarily accepted all these invitations. And we take this with us to school. And these uh, relaxation exercises, uh, which motivate children to take a short break out or break, simply to feel better. and. We saw a short clip outside that we produced at our school in order to show how do our children feel before and after relaxation. And to me, as an interviewer, it was a very touching event and experience to see how do children feel if we do this regularly with our children. And one more thing to say before I pass the mic back to you. It is also a gain of information for ourselves, for us as persons, because we learned in these modules how important we are as teachers and as links to learning, to experiencing and to feeling. And this was a great 
big click that happens and we went out there with a lot of gratitude and we are really happy that we had this project with our pupils. Thank you, Britt, and thank you that you were here with us. Thank you so much. And thank you to Christine. And now I put on my moderator's hat again. I'll see you later then. So, thank you to all of you. Now, we shift gears. No, this is also necessary because it's not possible that we stand and talk here all the time. It's difficult to focus and to keep your focus. And I'm happy that Peter Hoek promised to lead us, to guide us through the day and to do some short exercises in between in order to give us an impression how we can interact with the stakeholders at schools and between among each other. Peter, you know him as an author, great books, but today we have the opportunity to experience him as a lecturer of the qualities that we need for our learning and development opportunities, and which are so important to us. Well, Peter, that's, that's the way it is. And to me, you are an esteemed colleague who taught me a lot how we can use clarity and creativity and warmth in our communications. And that learning can also be fun. So please, Peter. <clears throat> Do you hear me? First of all, I must ask you for your apologies for my German. I had German two years at the elementary school, but my love of your beautiful language is not matched with a corresponding language talent. Therefore, please uh, bear with me. In order to prepare for this opportunity, I thought what is possible which exercises can I do with you? Because when we work with children, we always try to create a space of confidence and trust where we meet each other without prejudice or expectations. The definition by Helle and Jesper of empathy is the fellow citizens, seeing the fellow citizens without prejudice and expectations, but just the way they are, which is a nice definition. And here we do not have the time to create such space. However, I thought of something I experienced, Heli, my wife, who is also member of our association, we were briefly to Venice. We were to Venice and we passed by a small church and the service was at the beginning and we stepped in. We never witnessed a Catholic service and then something happened which never happens in a Danish church. People stood up and the people sitting around or in front of them, they shook hands and introduced themselves by their names and within 30 seconds I would like, in 30 seconds, I'm going to ask you whether this is possible, uh, whether we can take this risk together. But before this, let me say something. What we are going to try is just like Helle told, we are going, we are trying to work with children and adults in a way that if you want to get into contact, that you have to remain at home with yourselves. If somebody 
when we the initiative was taken to establish this association. They told us others that after 30 or more years of experience of working with children, the problem was that was always seen, they always saw the same problem, and that was that the children and the parents were not at home with themselves. In, in German we say, I'm out of myself, I'm outrageous of enthusiasm or anger, but I'm not at home with myself. And if you're not at home with yourself, then you left yourself, because we live in a body, and if you are not in your body, you are not at home, and you, you cannot welcome your guests, because I'm, there's not a human at home. And therefore, the headline of our approach is how to encounter and how to meet the world and your fellow citizens while at the same time staying at home with yourself. And staying at home with yourself means First of all, to feel your body. Try this for a moment. Close your eyes. Just f feel your body. This is half of the entire pedagogics. And it sounds banal, but it is not so easy. We always forget our body. Feeling your body. And this feeling of your body is supported when you feel your breath, so the body space, and in the body, breathing space. So this precious and spontaneous breathing that begins when we are born, it begins, and when we die, we exhale a last time, but between these two, two events, breathing is a silver thread that connects all the events and experiences, feeling your body and breathing. And her heart, not the biomechanical pump, but the empathy the compassionate feeling of totality or of affiliation, all this has a physical reflex in the breast, so bre body, breathing and heart. Very simple, but so important. And if possible, if it's possible, we can stand up and just like in Venice, turn to your neighbor and people around you and introduce yourselves to them. So just do that. Just tell your name. Schön, Peter. <laughs> okay, great. Lovely. Gucken. <laughs> ja. <laughs> Yeah, and then and then sit, and then take your seats again. And now, please take your seats.
please, please. Lovely. And please, please take your seats again. That was better than Venice, even though we always try to avoid equations in our approach. It was really better than Venice. So this very short and simple and banal symbol, please take it as a picture of our pedagogical approach. With very simple means, we try to approach children or adults and to bring them into contact with themselves and to learn how to come into contact, to get into contact with themselves. And, and with this ever deeper contact with oneself, you try to improve your contact with the outside world and with your fellow citizens. It is as easy as that. We say it is not possible to better get to know a fellow citizen than you know yourselves. And the opposite is probably also true. You need experience of trust and contact in order to be able to delve deeper into yourselves. So, fundamentally, this is what it is about. And, and the, there are two directions, as Heller already said. There's a collective one, a relation-based. We work with relationships between humans, just like this very simple example of making contact and show a little kindness. And this is the relationship part, the relational part. And then we work specifically and individually, how can a child or an individual get to know themselves better? And it's always the same fundamental door that leads into a human, and this is body, breathing, heart feeling, and awareness, a very simple door or portal through which you go into the world or meet the world with a kind, with your voice, with your breath, with an open heart, and with mindfulness and awareness. And the same door or the same portal also lead deeper into your self. This was what I wanted to communicate. <laughs> I, I took the role of a break pause clown. I come back and uh, do some funny things and see you later. Thank you very much, Peter. I'm looking forward to the next time. Mette, it's also a pleasure to welcome you here. Mette, together with Peter Zenke, has done a lot in order to increase the awareness that a system change is necessary. She is um, working at the MIT and also a member of our advisory board, Empathy Makes School, and the Danish Association. Your ability to reach a lot of people is something that we need, and uh, I'm looking forward to hear some content from your work. Thank you very much. My phone, because it has a clock on it.
and um, I can talk for hours about this because I'm really uh, um, enthusiastic about the work that we're doing and how I'm um, able to be in this space here today. So um, I, I don't even want to apologize that I'm not speaking in German because it would be so dreadfully boring to all of you if I tried. I haven't been speaking uh, kein Deutsch für 30 Jahre, so I'm not going to try. Um, I hope that this will work out. Um, please don't hesitate to ask questions. I will understand questions also in, in German. Um, and I have German ancestry, so I feel pretty uh, good about standing here today. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a special uh, treat, really, to be part of or have some kind of role in this particular work that uh, is led by Hille. Um, and as Hille shared, I, uh, I run the, I'm the executive director of a center, uh, what we call a non-for-profit, uh, called the Center for Systems Awareness. It's based out of the U.S., but we work globally with... Um, systems change in education, but what we call it compassionate systems change. And, um, and then uh, recently we had the opportunity to also, I've been a, a research scientist at MIT for a couple of years, but now we also have a lab at MIT where we're studying the impact of this work. And as those of you at least who come out of the academic traditions, you can all imagine uh, having MIT in the same sentence as the term compassion actually helps quite a bit. So we get to talk to people in a, in a somewhat different way about the necessity of cultivating skill sets of caring of uh, you know, being friendly amongst each other, of wanting to participate in a good way in social relations and so on. So many of the things that uh, Hillis' work is really identifying and cultivating with uh, teachers and students both. Um, I have the uh, great opportunity to work around the world and I just want to give you kind of an overview of what that looks like. So we have... Um, it, this might not be logical to you at all, but I didn't know how to illustrate it. So in some places we work primarily with schools and school sites. Those are the red dots. Um, and then I see it's not entirely updated, but the ones with the, uh, with the ripple effects are where we've had the opportunity to work um, district-wide uh, or statewide or uh, countrywide. So, um, for example, in Southeast Asia, we have a kind of a, a collaboration between um, Dulwich Colleges that are founded in Singapore, but has a cluster of schools throughout Southeast Asia in collaboration with uh, the Woodley Schools of Australia, which is about 32 schools, uh, and uh, the Catalyst Project in Hong Kong, which has seven schools and so on and so forth, and that's a kind of a collaboration there. I do want to focus, however, on, on the uh, work in California, which is my, um, my primary focus as of now, because, or for this uh, time being, because this is where we have the opportunity to really study the impact of the work. And, and uh, we have the great opportunity to work at the, uh, with the, uh, the, the State Department of Education in California, several counties, which is like the regions, uh, and districts, and students, and other entities around that. And so the systems part becomes actual and real in a process like this. Same as the case in British Columbia and Canada, we work uh, um, province-wide in British Columbia, which means we work with the Ministry of Education, but also the Ministry of Health and Wellbeing. We work with uh, UBC, the University of British Columbia. We work with the superintendents. We work with the principals. We work with the students. We work with the teachers and so on. And this is important. And I'm sure all those of you who are in schools will know exactly why this is important, right? Because we see so many great initiatives that are somehow implemented into schools. And then there's no buy-in from the people above in the system, or there's buy-in from the superintendent or whatever that person is called in this system here. And then that person leaves, and oh, no more focus on this particular project because that lived with that one person who now made the decisions. And, and for a, a project with, like Hillis, which is not a programmatic intervention, I want to walk you through a model of just showing how much deeper something like this can go, because we're wanna, wanting to get out of the predicament that it lives, this kind of work lives with individuals in the systems, and to something that's actually a kind of a collective orientation to how we do school, how we educate, what's the purpose of education. So, um, since I have limited time, and I can go on forever, I'm going to check my phone regularly, um, and uh, I also want to just highlight, and this is the uh, spoiler alert, uh, highlight two things that I would like you to take away from this particular little uh, um, talk. 
So one is, um, which is, you know, part of why I'm standing here today, one is that um, really well-educated people over the last couple of hundred of years, really well-educated people, mainly men, not saying anything, just pointing out facts, have made the decisions that led to where we are today. Climate change, extinction rates, lack of health and well-being all over the world, rapidly declining, suicide rates growing, and so on and so forth. That's the reality that we live in. And most of the decisions that led us to this place were made by people who were really influential and had really good educational backgrounds. So clearly, something needs to change in education. <laughs> That's the one kind of point. And secondly, and that's what I'm going to try to illustrate with this little model here, what we call the systems awareness iceberg. Um, basically, what I want to highlight is this understanding that structure shapes behavior. And I'll walk you through this in a moment so you don't have to kind of try to figure it all out now. But the point is, I hear over and over again everywhere in the world, the system is broken. And no, it's not. The system is producing exactly the outcomes it was designed to produce. So if these are the outcomes of kids being miserable, of teachers being miserable, of you know, lack of respect and understanding and of no real care infused in the system, then the very structure that we designed the system around needs to change. And that's why it won't do that we have yet another programmatic intervention. As Hilly was saying, it's not about you know, an off-the-shelf program that can now come and fix things. So I'm going to walk you through this uh, model here because I hope that that might somehow resonate a little bit and bring about this, what we call the systems awareness perspective, which to me, and I'm super biased, so you'll have to, you know, I have to apologize in advance, but to me is essential and what is lacking in most places in education around the world, that we truly understand that structure shapes behavior. We need to change the structure in order to produce different outcomes. So at the... You know, surface, above the surface, we all know, we see approximately between 7 and 12% of the iceberg, right? And that's what we call the events. And events are the stuff that kind of overwhelms us or hijacks us emotionally. And, and with good reason often, think about that day in February when Russia invaded Ukraine. Of course it overwhelms us. Of course we're kind of caught by that the situation in Europe all of a sudden destabilizing to a degree we haven't seen in many, many years, and it's f you know, frightful and all of that. Or at the everyday level, um, think about how many little messages we get in every day. All the little pings and bings. You've noticed the sensory overwhelm that we're all in constantly, because it's oh so important that we pick up on everything that's going on. The thing is, our brains have not evolved to the, um, I should probably say that I'm a biologist and I will talk about brains a little bit also. So I think we forgot to, um, I, you said my name, so I don't have to care about that, great. Um, <coughs> I'm a biologist, by the way. And, uh, and so I studied the evolution of complex social systems and I'm really interested in seeing, not just at the brain level, but also at the kind of embodied level, how when we come together, what actually happens and how we can improve that what we call the social field, which is why my uh, you know, affinity for Hellas work is, is goes very deep. Um, so at the event level, our brains have not evolved to deal with the level of information, the sensory input that we are confronted with every day. We just it's just not brain has not caught up to social media. And um, and the average American uh, teenager gets between four and seven hundred different messages a day. Just I mean, I can't even handle three text messages. I'm like, oh, no. So I don't quite know how people do it. But what we do know is that it puts us in a, in a kind of a heightened state of alert. What we call the amygdala response system is constantly activated. And that creates a new baseline. But it creates a new baseline where the buffer or the resilience is just uh, diminishing over time because we're constantly in that space. The only way we know of how to kind of counterbalance that in, uh, from a scientific perspective, is through uh, rigorous and uh, um, continuous mindfulness practices. It's the only way we've learned so far. So when we talk about contemplative practices, learning how to breathe, what we just did with 
pay that with uh, the kind of, you know, engaging in a different way, but kind of keeping a bodily focus. Why we talk about compassion and cultivating this spirit of kindness and sensitivity to what's going on around us is essential to counterbalance that. Chances are slim that m social media is going to go anywhere anytime soon. So either we stay with this predicament where there's a constancy of overload and heightened anxiety that comes with that, sense of disconnect, uh, you know, being overwhelmed by things, or we find the ways in which we might, in a meaningful way, coexist with the way of the world. And the only way we know how to do that is actually through uh, these types of practices. It doesn't have to be called one thing or the other. I work in many different contexts. I've worked in the country of Jordan, for example, with you know, very uh, conservative imams and Bedouin tribes. And we talk about you know, the presence of the heart, which is essential to their whole, uh, um, you know, their whole understanding and the way in which they operate in life. So it's not different. It, it exists within our cultures already. We know that being able to focus, being able to take a deep breath when we need to is actually really important. So at this event level, what we see is, you know, this, what we can call the emotional hijacking. And usually it creates kind of a reactive response, right? And I'm particularly aware, of course, that that happens every day, all the time in schools. Kids acting out, kids getting into a fight, uh, something happening in the classroom. And there's an immediacy of having to fix that, having to do something about it. What usually happens, however, is what we uh, forget to see just below the surface is the patterns over time, or what we can call the behavioral dynamics, that leads to these events to erupt. So, you know, sometimes we do take, you know, to step back and try to look at what happened before, uh, you know, this little kid hit that other kid and we knew that they had, you know, some level of conflict and so on. So that we try to kind of focus on, well, something was going on before that. It didn't just occur in a vacuum. There is something that happened before and then some kind of eruption and now it's going to happen again. Now, what we usually see is that most uh, um, kind of interventions at the school level or in education in general are interventions at this level. So take, uh, we have lack of well-being, for example, so we invent some kind of well-being program that we try to insert into the system as it is already. Keep in mind the structure that was never ever created to embrace anything like a well-being program. And now we try to kind of stack it on top and we say, oh, the system is broken, let's fix it. And that's not the case. We are literally trying to insert something that, isn't, that hasn't been designed for, that is not living within the structure, and so it can only live with individuals. And as Helene mentioned, as soon as these individuals leave, the whole effort dissipates. And over time, how many of you are educators in here work directly in schools? Have you ever had the feeling that yet another program, and now we're going to do this, and it's probably not going to go anywhere anyway? Have you, anybody ever tried that? Yet another program, you know, this probably not going to go anywhere. Oh, this principal wants this, or this superintendent wants this, and we've tried it before. So, kind of a sense of resignation. Is that familiar territory? Because it is to educators everywhere else in the world I work. <laughs> For good reasons, right? We are now trying to insert some kind of new, um, we're trying to insert some kind of new uh, programmatic intervention so that we can fix these events up here, but what we're really not focusing on is the structure in place. And keep in mind, structure shapes behavior. So if we're not working to change the structure around so that when we do our work with social emotional learning or contemplative practices or empathy makshule, we can't actually make sure that this will be successful in any way because it will not live in the very structure of education. That's why the systems part of this work is really essential. Now, for most people, and I don't know if that's like this for you all, but for most people, when we say stuff like underlying structure, people's eyes glaze over a little bit, and we're like, yeah, well, I don't really know what that means anyway, and it's something out there. It's okay if you're feeling that way, because um, part of what goes into what we call the underlying structure is this thing, the artifacts. So it's the infrastructure. It's the, uh, how we organize. Who's in the meetings? Who gets invited? Who creates the agenda? Who sits where? All the kind of tangible uh, um, aspects of how we are thinking about things lies in the artifacts. It's the metrics. What do we measure? The sad 
truth is we usually measure what we know how to measure, and then we say that those are the important things. Right? Nobody's ever come up with a good sense of measure for a sense of belonging or love or feeling cared for, which we all know is probably, you know, basic human foundational needs and actually increases academic performance way, way more than any programmatic interventions designed to increase academic performance has ever done. But we just don't know how to measure that well. That's what we're trying to, uh, I won't say fix, but at least we're looking at that at MIT, at our new lab, and uh, in, in collaboration, of course, with a lot of other people around the world who see things the same way. Um, it's also the policy. How many of you have been actively taking part in creating policy around education? A couple of people. Mm? Policy and curriculum, how many have been uh, actively developing new curriculum in here? A mm? few people. So policy, curriculum, metrics, all of those things are the kind of the tangible, uh, the manifestations, if you will. But what is really essential is what we talk about as the mental models. So whereas the artifacts are the also die Art und Weise, wie wir die mentalen Modelle sehen, das sind Gewohnheitsdenkweisen, das ist Denken, Fühlen und Handeln. Und darauf wird in der Regel nie eingegangen, wenn wir also einen neuen Lehrplan entwickelt sehen und glauben, dass dieser Lehrplan wirklich etwas denkt. Wenn wir nicht die mentalen Modelle angehen, dann werden dieselben Lehrer sich genauso auf dieselbe alte Weise verhalten und genau dasselbe lehren, was überall gelehrt wird. Und das passiert. Das funktioniert dann nicht, wenn wir, es reicht nicht nur den Lehrplan zu ändern, aber wir müssen die mentalen Modelle zusätzlich ändern. Und die Grundaussage geht. Why it's much more long term because this is hard work, right? It's not as if we can do it out there. We have to do it in here. But as we could hear, it's also very gratifying because all of a sudden we actually get to show up as real humans doing the real work. And these are our kids. It's the future of society. Of course, they should be met with real humans doing the real work and knowing how to care and knowing how to show that care in a meaningful way. So this whole level here, uh, our habitual way of thinking and feeling and acting is basically, you know, the lenses through which we're able to see the world. And anybody who tells you that, oh, I fixed it, I've noticed my, oh, I've seen all my mental models now, that's not true. <laughs> They're trying to trick you in some way because it's hard. It is literally the, the water we swim in, right? The, the best way in which we can come to, to uh, uh, some kind of meaningful perception of our own mental model is by being confronted with someone who has significantly different mental models. Now back to social media and all the echo chambers we're all in now. Less and less of that is uh, available in the world as compared to at least when I was a kid and when most of us were younger, right? Because now the algorithms will keep feeding us all the same stuff that they think we want to hear. And of course we click on it all, right? You won't believe he did that. Oh, my brain is already there. And now I'm clicking on all these, th all these things. Uh, I don't know about you all, but mine is like videos of dogs. I get a lot of those in my new feed, news feed. Um, and, uh, and, and so that means that most of the other people that I will ever see or hear or interact with through the social media platform will be the other people who also like videos of dogs. Might be some of you in here. Um, but, but, but the thing is, that means that I can't now be con confronted with my mental models or understanding how I'm showing up in the world. It just becomes, that's just the way it is. And that's why we see the polarization we do in, in politics all over the world right now, which is a dangerous place for us to be, particularly in this time when we know that the mental health and well-being of our young people everywhere in the world is declining rapidly. Suicide rates are growing so intensely that I don't stand here just as a scientist and just as somebody who really loves doing this work, but I'm also a mother and I'm a grandmother, and I truly, deeply am concerned about the trajectory that our children are, um, you know, that they're on, that the path to the future does not look at all like what I would wish for my children and my grandchildren and ev all the other kids in this world. Because somehow, it seems to me at least, they're all our kids. We all need to care about them. And in a meaningful way for us to do that, we have to create those spaces around them where the, where the adults that surround the kids can show up in a little different way and really embrace this, you know, humanness 
and growth and developing and flourishing of humanness. But that's not enough if we only work with the teachers and the principals. What about the district leaders? And what about the policy makers? If they don't understand this work, it's not probably going to live and it's not going to create this whole, um, you know, uh, um, change of structure so that we see significantly different events in, in future. Um, you know, hopefully, my hope would be we could come back together here in 10 years or 15 years and we can say, yeah, we actually did it. We managed to change the structure around into something that is, you know, a flourishing pathway for humankind and all the other species on our planet. So um, <coughs> what I would like you to do now, and it's only an invitation, but you all have a little piece of paper and a pen, I think. Uh, so my suggestion is that you write down, you draw down an iceberg. It's always easier if you actually draw it. And think about it in a meaningful context for yourself. Think about an event that makes sense to you, something that has some level of kind of emotional resonance. And I don't mean think about COVID, because that'll become one big abstraction. But if you're thinking about something in COVID, think about the day I discovered I had COVID, or someone I knew died, or something like that. So it's a particular event, so it becomes more meaningful. And then I would just invite you to go down the iceberg and try to you know, look at what might be the patterns over time that led to this particular event, or the behavioral dynamics of the system, if you will. And what are some of the uh, elements of mental models and artifacts that I could begin to look at in this. And this is not a test. <laughs> you should say that in a room full of educators, right? This is not a test. It's not, there's no trick in it at all. But it's just a way for you, an invitation for you all to begin to reflect on this particular way, which is the, the, you know, the entry model we use for beginning to teach systems awareness. And then um, take a couple of minutes doing that. And then I'll invite you to just chat with your next door neighbor on what are some of the elements that I found here that might be actually, you know, evocative or something I hadn't thought about or, you know, if there's confusion and so on. Unfortunately, we can't take questions from the whole space. So just, you know, if there are uh, questions of clarification, you might actually, there's so much uh, experience and, and knowledge and wisdom in this room. So you might as well just try to find it with each other. Um, and as a service announcement, Lucas translated the whole thing. <laughs> Thank you, Lucas. So uh, here it is in German. I'm not going to um, read it out loud. But uh, take just a couple of minutes drawing down an iceberg. And, uh, and then in about three minutes or so, four minutes, I'll ask you to just check in with your next door neighbor. Ready, but whenever you're ready, just turn to your next door, uh, the person next to you, and um, and share your thoughts.
ะโอเคไอคันซีแต่ไอ้มาเปอร์เรตติ้งในสไลด์ลี่ดิฟเฟนต์คัลเจอร์และนบอดี้แอคชั่นนี่รู้สึกว่ามันคืออะไรคุณและฉันก็ควรจะยืนยันตัวเองด้วยแล้วที่นี่ห้องสว่างขึ้นไม่ได้ทำงานที่ควรจะทำขอบคุณ Um, so I'm mindful of the time, and I know that I might be cutting your conversation short. But just keep in mind, we do have additional time at, during the reception, and I hope that at least this facilitated some level of kind of uh, sparked conversation or uh, you know uh, desire to explore further. Uh, should you be interested in knowing more about this whole domain of systems awareness and our compassionate systems framework, um, we have websites for the center and for our uh, MIT uh, lab as well, and um, of course you're always welcome to reach out. And I know that Hela will always be able to also, um, should you have questions or comments or anything like that, to to make sure that I see them. So, um, yeah, a few questions. Yeah, I think so. Christine, you are there. I I must Deutsch reden. Jetzt muss ich das erinnern. Okay, the mic is on. We asked the two of you whether you feel like asking a question to Mette. As Professor Dr. Ulrike Becker, the Senate Administration for Education, Youth and Family. Yes, thank you for hosting us today. The event connects directly to the principals meeting we had this morning for all principals of Berlin's elementary schools. The way towards the elementary school 2030 and Andalore Brenning 
also talked about the topic of reflections because appreciating relationship work with children at school is one of the most important instruments in order to facilitate development among children. And therefore, I'm totally happy that I had the opportunity to attend both events because, as I said, it connects directly to each other. It was also said this morning by Professor Ramsecker about the culture of digitality. And this was also about the question that a third socialization instance is here. And he stressed out the importance of young influences for children, which was another interesting impulse. And next Wednesday, the event will continue with 14 working groups also on topics regarding elementary school 2030 and appreciating relationship work, recognition and acknowledgement cultures also represented there with several working groups. Also learning for sustainable development. Schweizerhof Elementary School is also here. We'll talk about um, the Friday topic, which is a great innovation that is already implemented at many schools and which has been rolled out on a nationwide basis after it was launched by Margaret Rumsfeld. Ricana Reflections, presented by Anne Lore Prengel this morning, is also a nationwide or Europe wide. Um, project that is implemented at that level. And there are also several approaches, as it was said, regarding appreciating relationship work, which is now gradually being developed and passed on. What they have in common is, I think, is that relationship work is put in the foreground as one of the most important instruments in order to stimulate children to learn and to develop. And I think this is extremely important, and I appreciate very much what Hella Hansen presented today, the concept she presented today, and which is already intensively in use at school, the iceberg model. We are familiar with this when it comes to analyzing behavior of children who are seen to be particularly problematic or as coaching processes, or we know it from coaching processes. And if we look at the events you described here, and if we look at what is in the iceberg that is invisible, then we had the COVID pandemic and Ukraine war. We have strong social impacts on children's experience, on the experience of children, educators, teachers. They all have fears, which is very important and crucial in the current social situation. And then in the invisible part of the iceberg, we also have the early parent-child relationships that have a role to play relationships children have with their teachers and educators. And all this interacts and combines, and it also interacts with the impact from nature. We saw the melting glaciers. We didn't see it uh, at the iceberg example. We know it and other natural events, which are increasingly uh, in the focus of perception, which also trigger massive fears. And therefore, I think that this approach, empathy makes school, is particularly important in the current social situation and even more important than before the COVID pandemic. And I think it is a great approach and I would appreciate very much if it would be rolled out further in Berlin, not least because it's also a model for health prevention. And as you also said, it is totally important in order to support the well-being of those who are working at schools, burnout rates and sickness rates can be reduced. Um, um, personnel who are not available cause additional stress to those who continue working and all interacts. And it is very important that this approach is rolled out further. I, I do not have a concrete question. We just um, talked about this earlier, and I think this was also okay with you. 
So I pass on right to Mrs. Weick. Mrs. Wecker, thank you very much. Not a question. But I think you close the circle to the here and we keep in touch as far as it concerns Berlin. And thank you very much for being with us today. A question, a genuine question. I also want to, I do not have a question indeed. So not a question. Basically, it was self-explaining, but I think how can these mental models be focused more? This is important to me because we are still in these structures. I'm out now. I was also, I worked at the Senate administration, but I can see it in a very relaxed way as because I'm retired, but I see it even more clearly that school is still taking place as, say, a hundred years ago, I would put it. And what is so lovely with this Empathy Makes School program, and also from you, is the fact that people meet each other in a different way. If I offer professional qualification programs and if I can talk about topics with colleagues for which I normally do not have any time, normally I have a working relationship with my colleagues, but then I have the possibility to really exchange, for example, as it was said, morning death. I don't have that time at school. I don't have the space at school. And if I can appreciate my colleagues in a different way because they said things I didn't know from them before. And this relation work, relationship work and changing this relationship work, this is, and the question is, how can we focus more on these mental models? For some reason that is completely opaque to me, uh, our cultures, uh, particularly the westernized cultures, have somehow, uh, we seem to have forgotten the world of the inner landscape and that that feeds everything we do outwardly so that it's completely intertwined. How I feel is actually how I show up and how I show up will directly impact people around me. And oh, how people around me feel will impact me because we're social beings before we are anything else. And so the whole essence of that when we want to get around to working more closely with helping people recognizing that profound interconnectedness and, and uh, um, sense of connection that we have in the social field um, is, is requires, I think, a kind of a reset almost because we don't know how to navigate this space. That's why in all good social emotional learning program, we have emotional literacy as part of it, right? And here we have a strong focus on social competencies and so on, but it's not enough that it's something that is just kind of added onto the mix of everything else you need to learn in school. It has to be foundational. How I show up in this world and how I feel and how I get triggered by other people and why I get triggered by them. And oh, by the way, I'm the one who's getting triggered, so it can't really be your problem, can it? Which of course is a nuisance because it's much nicer when we can blame it on other people. I certainly prefer that, but it doesn't really work that way. It's not the other people's fault. We're the ones who are in this predicament of responding and reacting in a particular way. So we are the ones who can work with that in a meaningful way. And I think that's a lot of the kind of essential work where we are really aligned about what needs to happen. And I will say in the places where we have been the most successful, this happens literally at the level of the ministry, the level of the counties or the Bundes, whatever, Bundesländer, danke. Uh, <coughs> whatever regions are called in this country, because they are named differently in everywhere I work. Uh, and and so, so it has to be that kind of uh, uh, joint venture in a sense that everybody actually has to do this. Part of what we uh, do, which I think is actually the most important part of our work, is we have a youth leadership team, and they work directly with students. And I don't know if you can imagine, but Mostly when our site development team goes out and works with the teachers and the principals and I work with the leadership and the boards and all of that and then our youth leaders work directly with the students. So the students don't have to unlearn a whole lot of shit before they can do this. 
So they will show up after a couple of hours, be like, here's an iceberg, I want this to change because this is clearly how I'm thinking about things and so on and so forth. And teachers are flabbergasted because they're like, how can you understand? I can't even understand what's going on here. And now you've just analyzed this whole situation that we're in. So the resources of empowering young people and the courage it takes for educators to actually allow that to happen, I think that's an essential and pivotal uh, kind of orientation that we need to bring in if we really want to focus on the mental models. So thank you. Thank you, Mette. I love it, listening. And it was also good to hear this last explanation regarding mental models. So I would be delighted if you attend a German class and then come to Berlin. <laughs> well, now we have a short break here. Thank you, Mrs. Ulrike Becker, Mrs. Heike Waldschitz. Thank you so much. And now we take a 15-minute break, more or less 10 or 15 minutes, please, and then we meet again here.
Uh, hey, so, uh, <clears throat> so please take your seats again. Okay. Right, yo. So we'll So welcome back from the break. And fortunately now, Peter is again with us, and he's going to show us something. During the break, I asked, what do we need? And everyone said, we need a little bit physical exercise. So is it possible, please, that everybody stands up? And each of you. You stretch, you, everybody stretch, please. So it's also a German class for me today. And please put your hands on your hips and circle around. Circle. Just circle. And maybe you touch your neck with your hands or massage your neck a bit. If we work with children and ask, for example, a group of children, 14, 15 year olds, do you feel your own body? They often say, no. Or only if if they have an injury from playing football, otherwise not. But after a couple of weeks or months, if we ask them again, then most of them say, "Now I feel my body." So exercises, for example, bend to the side in in order to stretch one side. And the other side, yes, and of course you continue breathing and with your feet, what is, what is good for you, and the exercises and the physical exercises are never dogmatic, it's just a proposal. So, you are your own authority in your own body. So what is possible with your feet? But contact with the soil is of course um, important for the feet's perception. And your face, these mask-like tensions that accompany communications. So relax your face a bit. And social control is always connected to voice. So we do a controversial sound like this one. One more time. And then we ask the children, feel your inside. How is that? Is it possible to feel energy within yourself 
and maybe you feel some relief after this controversial movements and take a deep breath every human is has a certain basic mood in nine out of ten mornings you wake up with a fundamental inner temperature or mood and we need the three big composers as a picture you can be mozart this means you wake up with optimism says yes a new day yes or oh, you can be beethoven life is struggle and a new day is looming or in between a powerful neutrality just like Bach and in all the three composers there are all the three moods but nevertheless there is one fundamental mood so ask yourselves without your co without losing contact with your body are you a Mozart basically optimistic are you Beethoven a new day or Bach if you are Mozart then you must get to know the dark because so many feelings and compassion and deep aspects are located in the dark and if you are Beethoven you must get to know light-mindedness and ease so and if you are Bach you do not have the extremes and you must get to know the extremes so there are advantages of to know all the three positions and you ask yourself what am I and then we do a little game with the children you can also exhale your basic mood so your basic mood contact with your basic mood or your mood right now are you tired or are you excited or no one knows feel your present mood and then exhale your present mood in order to give way to something new to the next one who wants to say something so inhale and exhale in order to welcome something new and one more time the present mood and exhale this present mood and try to prepare for something new physiologically mentally and one last time inhale and exhale yes and then feel for 10 seconds your body breath and this little attempt to release awareness and to open up for something new thank you we continue thank you very much Now I would like to introduce Birgitte Nielsen. She is an associate uh, professor in Aarhus and uh, research leader at the Institute for Pedagogy and also part of our research team. You have dealt with teaching a lot and have taught me a lot as well about the implementation and you've taught me about qualitative 
analysis in regard to complex topics. So I'm very pleased to have you here today, together with Katsinga Gatsche, who sits next to you. I would like to also introduce you. Katitska is at the head of our association, uh, Life Wisdom for Children, and also teaches at the University of Aarhus and works in different projects about relational competency and mindfulness. Together, we have had a very enriching cooperation and Katsinka also co-developed the program Empathy Makes Schools. Make school. So welcome to both of you and uh, I give the floor to you. Welcome. Yes, and uh, Helle did already present us, so thank you for the nice presentation. But just shortly, <laughs> we plan to start by saying I'm Jagitta, I'm the research leader from uh, from Teach Education in uh, VIA, in Denmark, and this is my colleague. Yeah. <laughs> Though we're not at the same institution, we like to think about each other like so. Yeah. So I'm Katinka, and in this project that we will talk about, the, I have been the practical person and Birgitta the researcher. Yeah. And the title is there. I think it's better that we stand over here mm. so we do not stand in the way. Uh, supporting student teachers in competences <laughs> and mindfulness uh, in Danish teacher education uh, program. And it's actually from work we have also done with Helle. And for this language issue raised by many here, <laughs> I did also learn German in school and I understand when you speak to me in German, but I feel more free when speaking in English. So we're going to do that in this presentation. So, okay. And I hope this one is on. Yes, it was now. Yes. What we are, uh, first, the context. The context of what we are going to give you examples from is uh, pre-service teacher education. And I need to say that, it, that in Denmark, it's an integrated program, a four years professional bachelor program. And uh, this is how the teachers for a primary and lower secondary school is educated. Uh, and this is the context. Uh, and what we're going to do is that we're going, uh, Katinka is in a moment going to give you some background and examples from uh, how we have worked with the student teachers. Uh, and uh, this will be several examples, but one of them will be an extracurricular course from uh, 2019 to 20 where we have worked with uh, mindfulness-based uh, stress reduction and also with uh, professional focus on relational competences. And then after that, I give a few examples from the research uh, where we have, uh, in particular from this course, where we had both qualitative and quantitative data. And I'm going to present for you uh, ex examples from a somatic analysis. And what the agenda is here, is to look on this from the perspective, not from the teacher, not from the researcher, but actually from what are the student teachers saying? What are meaning, the meaning of being uh, involved in this from the perspective of the student teachers? So this is what we're going to do. Mm. And you're going to start. Yeah, I am. So, um, oh, that was too much. This. The first project that I'll just present to you is our first big cooperation with, with the VIA University College and the teacher education. And we were very happy that we could get uh, into a cooperation with, with the teacher education because that was actually a possibility to come into the educational system and to try to actually change some structure, as Meta was talking about before. So um, the structure in this project was quite important, so as well as the content, of course, but we structured it in a way where we were teaching stu uh, student teachers, uh, their educators on the uh, teacher education, and teachers from local schools where the student teachers were having their internships. 
because we thought it was important that when the teachers, when they knew, uh, when they learned new knowledge, they would be met by the same knowledge from their educators and from the teachers that they were going to meet in the schools while doing their internships. Um, so that was that was uh, the structure of that. What was also quite important here was that this was not voluntary. Two classes started in 2012, actually 10 years ago. They started and they were on their first day of school presented uh, for this project uh, as uh, you are you are having a gift. This is a gift to you. You are a participant in this project. I promise you, not all of them thought it was a gift in the beginning. <laughs> But they, after a while, they, they, they s sort of uh, got into the project. And after their first internship, they were really happy about it because they could see they actually learned something that was helpful for, for them when they got out with the children in the schools. Um, It was voluntary from the, for the teachers and from, for, for the educators. Next project that I will talk, will talk about, actually we had some projects in between, also in a cooperation with Via University College, an Erasmus project uh, called Hand in Hand, where we worked with social emotional learning and diversity awareness. But um, the next project that I will just present to you here was an extra Uh, curricular course, and that is the newest one, and the one Birgitta will talk about uh, in in a short while. And um, that was the content was sort of the same as in the first big project, but we structured it a little bit different because that was uh, what was possible at at the teacher college at, at at that time. So this time it was voluntary and it was extracurricular. So that means it it the the, the training took. Uh, took place after after their normal school day. Um, it was a semester, and we had four four courses, to, yeah, in two years. So first, we had a full day of training where we introduced the students to the project, where they got to know each other, where they were be they they became a group, they were uh, getting confidence to each other, and uh, and then they got this MBSR course mindfulness-based stress reduction. And that is a very structured, maybe some of you know uh, uh, this mindfulness program, but for those of you who, who doesn't know it, it's, it's a very structured mindfulness program that lasts over eight weeks and when you're, where you're having your training mindfulness uh, exercises every week and you're training it for yourself uh, in between. So they were having this mindfulness course. And after that, we were uh, sort of bridging back to relational competence. So we were both interested in the perspective from, from the students. How can you use this? Is this, is this actually uh, uh, valuable to you? Can you use it when you are out in the school? Is it, is, it, uh, is it something that you can use as being a professional teacher? So we were doing uh, the bridging and we were teaching them in relational, relational competence um, for four four times four hours. Yeah. So in both projects, actually in all the projects we have been doing together, we, we of course have some goals or some aims before starting. And some of you might recognize the last dots here uh, because that is part of uh, the definition of relational competence that Helle Jensen and, and Jesper Juhl did also many years ago, I think it was back in 2002 or something, two or three. So to see each child on its own terms, to attune your behavior to the situation and to maintain leadership and be authentic. And to do that, you actually need some competences being a teacher. That is not easy just to, to, <laughs> to read this definition and just act Uh, after that definition. So to see each child on its own term, you need empathy. You need to be able to understand the child. You need to, to know the background. And as Meta said before, you need to know that it's not only the top of the iceberg. It's not only the acting that is on stake. You need to, to, to know something about the child. 
to attune your behavior to the situation. And I know, I mean, that, I, I, I guess that everybody here knows that that is not uh, necessarily very easy. You, you get under pressure and you just act out. Anyway, that's, that's how I do it. Um, and to this, attune yourself to the behavior. You need to know where am I? What is the situation in me right now? What is my stress level? Uh, how do I feel? How do I think? Um, where am I? And then I need to regulate myself. Because it might be okay to, to notice, yeah, I'm very angry and I'm very much under pressure. But if I'm not able to regulate myself, it's very difficult to attune myself to a child who is also, uh, for instance, very angry. So you need to regulate yourself um, and to be in contact with your inner, inner strength and your core. And the last part, the ability to be aware and present. If you're not present, if you're not aware, it's really hard to notice a child and it's really hard to notice yourself. So these are sort of the aims that we, uh, or the goals that we are aiming at, or how you say this in, in proper English. Um, so the content, and this is of course uh, very much, um, it's very overall, but we, we had some theoretical presentation uh, on the framework um, for the student teachers on relational competence on the Pentagon. I thought actually that we would see a model of the Pentagon, but um, we, we, we will have to refer to that um, presentation on communication, conflict and on mindfulness. And then we did uh, a lot of inner exercises or mindfulness exercises as we have been doing now with Peter. We did dialogues to verbalize what we know about ourselves, to, to make it more uh, into the world, the knowing, and to verbalize it. We did dialogues. We did gear shifts, as we have also been doing with Peter now, to know yourself, to get to know, be familiar with. It is actually possible to shift in gear. It is possible to regulate yourself so that you can uh, regulate, attune to the child, and also learn the child that it can actually regulate itself. Um, then we did a lot of playing, making a group, being together in a group to, f to, 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 uh, to feel the joy of being in a group and, and the joy of playing together. That it's actually not serious to learn, it's actually fun and it can be really, really nice being together and play together. And the last thing that, that we were doing, we called 60-40 exercises and we have been uh, introduced to these exercises by Peter because that is actually to split your awareness between yourself and the other. To know what is going on here and at the same time be aware of the other person or the whole group. Normally when you are like me standing here, I'm very much out. What is going on? Do I, do I have everybody uh, with me? And I forget about myself. What is actually going on here? So this training in in splitting the awareness or feeling or uh, going back and forth, knowing I'm here and you are there at the same time. So that was the content. And now, Birgitte. I think I need to use this. It's both uh, quantitative and qualitative data. Uh, the, it, there has been in this course, the last course uh, Katinka talked about, there's been a randomized controlled trials with a weightless uh, control group. Uh, and uh, then there's been uh, multiple qualitative data, in-depth interviews and written reflections and uh, where the student teachers has written about their learning outcomes, their challenges and surprises. And all this uh, uh, have been through a reflective thematic analysis, and there I'm going to present some examples from it. And it's uh, published uh, open access. Uh, the first pa paper there, the link in front of us, there's a paper about the, the, re the, uh, the uh, quantitative data. And then the, the last link is a link for paper, actually in Danish, but with an English abstract. So uh, you can read more about this because it will be very short what I'm able to say here. 
first. Uh, the, the, I, I won't go into details with all the numbers and all the statistics. Uh, I think you can read about that. But the important thing is here that uh, there was actually seen statistically uh, significant effects on, uh, on the, the mental health of the student teachers after this program. Uh, it was f found on the perceived stress, on symptoms of uh, anxiety, and also on well-being. And this was a background that we it, it put us ourselves in the question is what is the background for these results? And this is why we're interested, really interested in meaning from the perspectives of the student teachers. And when I say meaning here, it's uh, like meaning seen as the uh, underlying motivation behind thoughts, actions, and the interpretation and the application of knowledge. So we were looking into the meaning seen from the perspective of the student teachers, and this I'm going to talk about shortly. We, uh, uh, we uh, collected the results under the five themes here, which I'm going to talk about. Something about fruitful tensions first, and then uh, also something a little about tensions with a synthesis in both body and brain. And uh, then they talk very much about difference compared to the normal performance-oriented rotation in education. And they talk about a sense of community and learning together. And then they talk about professional competence to use with pupils and colleagues in schools. And this is what I'm going to talk you into shortly with quotes from the student teachers. Before going into the first two themes, this a part of our research questions was also, you, know, you heard they were volunteers, these student teachers. Why did they actually sign up for this? This was the first questions. And they actually, it was interesting to see, it was very different student teachers. They said it themselves as a kind of surprise different people who uh, go into this course. And they, some of them were familiar with mindfulness, but not all of them. And some of them actually said themselves from the beginning, I was cur curious, but a kind of negative towards the thinking about mindfulness. So this, they were quite different. And they, when they talked about their uh, intentions, those were also different intentions. Here's a quote from one of them, which is, it's both intentions which is about something which is personal and something that's professional. Here, there's to be something for the pupils working as a teacher. I need to learn how to take care of myself. It's a quote from one of them talking about why going into this course. So. But then the, th the themes, the first thing here, this that it's well known, but also different. It's a kind of both and theme. So when I talk about tensions here, it's tensions in a kind of positive way that they talk about going in depth, adding to what it's already known. As Katinka said, they work with relational competences. It's part of the curriculum. They have had all worked with that. And they say, we see, we see this as quite important in education. And it's important to hear more about, to go into depth with the research. So this is something which is quite well known to them. But the interesting issue here is when they talk about that, they say, but also something which is quite different to them, something that's new. So this is the tension between the well-known and something which is quite different. This, that they're at the same, uh, being challenged in a positive way by new and different approaches, and again quotes here, being present in the room in quite a new way. And this, I didn't experience something alike before. And those are student teachers who had been there for some of them for, for three years. So that's uh, quite important, this tension between the new. And another kind of tension here is this about body and brain. You saw it al already started here when they talk about getting to know more about the research background uh, and about relational competences. They talk about getting to know something cognitive, the brain, but then the new thing also, zooming in on how is my body is reacting when I have an unpleasant experience, and this down in the body, feeling yourself. 
So this, uh, when the, uh, I, I just use the term fruitful tensions, it's a reference to some of the professional literature about, uh, uh, about teach education, this, that uh, tensions are there, they will be there when we work with student teachers. It's, uh, it cannot be all coherent but it can be fruitful tensions. And this is what we see here. Some of the new, the body part, the, this zooming in, it's added to something which is well known. And then the last one here, the last three themes I'll take here. Uh, and then they talk about this difference compared to the normal performance orientation, which is there for the student teachers like all students in, in higher education. This. They praise the overall approach, not going to an exam. You're sitting here without your computer, <laughs> singing ahead, a just here and now, working with professional practice. So they are talking very much into this competitive uh, performance culture and the acceleration, which is, for example, emphasized by Hartmut Rosa. Uh, and this, what they really emphasize as their outcomes here is that they work with the ability to remain in contact with themselves. <laughs> then the theme here about a sense of community, learning together. It's, uh, it's about them as peers in the new group. They got together, they didn't know each other in advance. Some of them might have done, but it was a new group. And this uh, something special, feeling your team involved and engaged give something of yourself and share with new people. And some of them also talked about this. We really, really quickly got to know some quite new people. And then they, they, they referred also, it's about among them and how they are together, but they referred also to how the relations grew with the, with the teachers from the course. They are kind of modeling, the teachers are modeling a way of being together, which kind of mirrored in the way the student teachers are together. And then last, they talk about uh, professional competence to use with future pupils and also colleagues in schools. Uh, the quotes here, tools to use in class in perplexing uh, situations. Your mindset, this is about your mindset, how you are as a teacher, values, approach to relations, about understanding pupils, the frustration when they want to but cannot do anything. Feel this in your own body. And the team of teachers, this is a quote about how they think this can be used when they go in and work together with the colleague in a team of teachers where we can discuss. If everyone is in about that, we can discuss how we can support the class. We do not know yet about those student teachers as new teachers, as uh, th some of them are not there yet. But what we know is that we know from uh, the first example uh, Katinka mentioned from the Relational Competence Project, they are actually, uh, the, the student teachers has been followed out in their first practice. If you saw the f movie when arriving, some of them were actually interviewed in that new movie too. And there, some of the research following them and a control group into their first practice uh, has shown how they work intentionally with relational, not just coincident when they have to, where there is a co coincidence where they have to. So this is uh, what we would expect to see. Also, we hope it can be able to follow up on those teachers here too. I think this was what I was going to say. Do you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. So, thank you very much. <laughs> thank I hope you. you can. <laughs> Max, Birgitta and Katzinka, and I'm so happy that you are going... Oh, and Entschuldigung, jetzt habe ich... Sorry. Uh, sorry. Thank you very much, Katinka and Birgitta. I was expressly told, only speak German, no English, and this is not what happens. Sorry. So, thank you so much. And I'm happy that it continues also in Denmark and also in teacher training, relational competence is quite an issue. Thank you very much indeed. Now, Lucas. 
und Corinna Angelarat und Dr. Lukas Herrmann. From our research from Empathy Makes School and it's underway now. Thank you very much. I'm delighted. We are delighted that we have the opportunity to hopefully, and I would rather say, and it reminds me of what Meta said, some of the artifacts relate, for example, to the fact that we use last name terms. I would go on first name terms because it's much more personal. So therefore, we would like to um, share with you a little bit about the research, not so much about quantitative results. Instead, we are going to zoom into our qualitative work instead. The starting conditions, maybe in order to is to build the bridge here. The bridge is first, where do we come from? And we already heard quite a lot about this, what the two speakers before said me. So what can we sell about research? What are the meta-analyses, systematic reviews, RTP analyses and other variants of studies which we refer to? These are of course the studies which determine our acting in the idea. Where do we want to go with research? And research is not an end in itself even though uh, it often seems to be so in the subculture of research. Instead, we want to go into more detail. We want to do evidence-based programs, and especially in education, there are many programs that pop up and disappear again for structural reasons, but maybe also because um, not a lot is research-based. So research means to describe and to explain something and to explain the effects and the implications. And this means research. And this is where we come into play. And one of the important points is designing relationships. We do not have to go into detail, but what Meta said. Here we get into a system where it is very difficult to measure something because we do not have the tools for that. So we are permanently in a situation, we are permanently in feedback loops where we have to check how do we get feedback and how can we measure the quality or at the level of concrete social interaction. How do we get to developing an understanding that can be quantified or that convinces people who do not want to go into detail and we also want to convince these people. So relational relationship quality is more than just the sum of concrete interactions. It is what happens in between, in the atmospherics, what we can feel. And of course, it's also supported by what we call relational competencies. So empathy, uh, compassion, uh, empathy, and all these aspects, you can measure them using questionnaires. How do, peop how do people behave? experimental, quasi-experimental, where do they complete the questionnaire, whether they assess themselves to be in this or one direction, but this has its pro and cons. So we are, we are addressing the question as to how it can be communicated to the world in order to understand what happened so from the result, but also in terms of what is produced in the process. And part, as Birgitte is one of those, as Helle introduced, she had the idea, and research also says this, that all the education programs live, live on how they are implemented, and there are many implementation models, how it is done, not just go there and say, we do an eight-week program here, you have the manual, do it, and then we leave again. Instead, much more is necessary in order to zoom into this and the whole school approach. So the integrated approach is very important. And as we already heard, in terms of the assistance thinking idea, so the idea, if we want to change the system, it is absolutely necessary. We cannot avoid this. We cannot pick individual people and isolate them and then expect that it will have an enormous impact. So we need the whole school approach. Another idea is specifically, if we think qualitatively and quantitatively, then we have many studies in the education areas that focus on teachers and school personnel because it's easy. Also in terms of administrative inputs, it's easier to, 
do research at that level, but pupils and stakeholders and to have sufficient quantities of these is very important, also parents and many others, as we heard. So the entire personnel, including pupils who must be given a voice. And the basic statement is the idea how we do research is an idea where we do not come from the outside and say we want to measure or uncover what goes wrong. Instead, what we are interested in is that we as a researcher team, together with the content team, we want to make a difference when it comes to focusing on the relational level. So the way we research also has an impact because you cannot research an object without having an impact. So the way we understand attitude, so the research questions are two areas. We focus on the outcome. What is the outcome of training at the relationship level, social efficiency, um, mindfulness, empathy, adopting perspectives in terms of previously it was before it was this way and after it was other. Next is the process and implementation. So looking into more detail, what is the process which all stakeholders go through? All the stakeholders also means we, for example, how we go into it or what we experience if we distribute questionnaires, because all this is part of the implementation practice. So what are the components? So what are the ingredients which are really relevant for the persons who did this or that? And how is the change process perceived? Is it perceived? In what direction does it go? So where are the obstacles and where do you have lows? And where are change moments also at the empirical level where we think that they are essential in order to make such a program effective? And you probably all know where we are with our problem. It is a longitudinal rather than a cross-sectional project. You need this for evaluation studies. We studied in 1219, then we had a COVID break, at least at the students' level. And we want to continue until 2025, which is not always usual because many research projects are very short-minded. And we have the quantitative and the qualitative part so that we have a mixed method approach, so a approach that gives a voice to both variants because if we produce numbers, and this is why I will not report any numbers on the quantitative parts, the question is always how to do meaning make and how do I interpret it and where can I also be humble um, of what the outcomes are at the quantitative level. And then it comes to the qualitative level where we hear more about it and how can I understand better what happens at the empirical level. I tend to switch to English. So at the empirical level, what does it do to the stakeholders? And this has much bigger impact in order to frame the qualitative, because a number can be high or low or statistically significant or not, but this alone doesn't tell a lot. And therefore the idea is we need a more complex variant in order to capture this data. The timeline, we looked at four, five and six graders for the quantitative level at the end of the school year. For the fourth graders, when they begin, these are six measuring times. And we also have six graders who leave school then, of whom we have only two time measuring points. But the idea is always that for every pupil, we can see some kind of change. All together, with the intervention school, we had 1,280 plus minus pupils. And in the control schools, we had 1,300. And we started with 1,400, and now fortunately we are back to 711. These includes all the schools. And it shows again, implementation also means it is hard work to produce these numbers because uh, there are many classes, maybe three, nine, or two pupils. And in order to get these numbers, there's a lot of work behind it without being a statement in terms of contents. But at this level, of course, we want to create a database in order to produce data that is sustainable or that can be generalized in terms of outcomes. And regarding personnel, we have the training.
And this is maybe another small intermediate step. Together with Birgitte, we tried to find out during the COVID period that we couldn't let it pass. And we also published this, what it meant, the lockdown and the changes, including structural changes. And the key message that was decisive here, it wasn't all bad. But depending on the starting conditions, there were also certain points where classes were smaller, there was more coherence on the idea that at the time I looked at the positive sides, which I can extract from this. It correlates at least with the idea that I have a strong feeling of empathy with my pupils. These were isolated points that we found in the meantime. Thank you, Corinna. In brief, these circles only show in a different form what Meta just said, that this change always takes place in a context. And that is very important what happens around. And now I take a leap with you right into the center. So what are the change moments? What happens really? So we talk about systems change and empathy. But what is it that happens in such a moment where we have a teacher and a pupil? Somebody learned something or got an input from Empathy Makes School. So how can it be connected? How is this bridge built? And this is the research question. Which changes do teachers see in their relations to pupils? And the interviews I did, and some of them also sit here, they experienced this. They focused on going into a moment when I saw, OK, I changed something compared to previously. Now I'm just in the midst of my data. I could talk forever about the different aspects, but I just picked one. And this is one. Compassion in the social field between self and the person vis-a-vis. -vis. So that this change is anchored in the person and experience is required that I encountered or that I met myself. Peter just said it. We can only meet so intensively as others are there for us in order to venture into ourselves. And this is reflected in the descriptions. I feel that the quality of the relationship changes if I look more at myself. And this has not only to do with here, the school and the children, but also my colleagues. This stopping and looking inside, I manage this in some situation and it impacts my whole personality. So these this brings us to the mental models that were mentioned. And this is hard work. This isn't easy. And these are sometimes vulnerable processes. However, if we do not manage this step in yourselves, then it will be difficult to meet a child or to encounter a child. Another quote, this self-feeling and acceptance, this this is there for oneself and for a child. The three days we had just at taking a look at ourselves, it goes, it concerns a model. So what is good for me? What is good for my well-being? And this um, meant to me that I understood that not everything needs to be perfect. So this structure to do it right, don't make a mistake. And this is all this mindset so why are schools so resistant to change? It is the structures, and the structures are also reflected in the way to be there. And unless an input is brought there, and if unless an input interrupts this, and uh, if no compassion is injected there, then nothing will change. And then at a certain moment, if you are standing in front of a child, a desperate child, for example, it doesn't come to terms with a task or an exercise. And to feel at that moment, OK, I cannot reach this child the way I am. I must slow down. This is only possible if you experience this inside. 
before. And then it was possible, and then this language is quite interesting, to allow myself to stop, to allow, to say, okay, both for myself and for the child. And therefore, it makes sense to me to talk about social fields, because this allowing is something which the teacher and the child experience. And I think otherwise I wouldn't have done it this way. Okay, then you don't write this today and you don't have to do this exercise. So the task, the academic tasks can also be reduced. But of course you can be there for the child in order to regulate the own feelings. But to do this switch, this takes work. And what can happen then is that this compassion and this acceptance in the interaction between the teacher and the uh, child appears and surfaces and becomes effective. And this is from another example where the previous way of the teacher to talk to the company is reprimand in order to change the child. The child disturbs the lesson and then I as a teacher say stop doing this. But what you communicate in such a physical resonance is a lot of message which causes a lot of confusion for the child. And the result, and maybe some of you know it, you are in an interaction and you do not know where it went. So at the end, you are suddenly in an argument and you do not know how it began. And you see, you defend something without knowing where it started. And this can become detached. And these are patterns like this. And the shift was then later to talk to the child in a different way is to make one's own limits visible. And in response to this, the child um, took notice of the other person's limits, but in between a lot must happen. And now I have the feeling it's flexible, we approach each other, but we can also move apart a little bit, the relationship changed. Um, previously it was tearing and then it became flexibility. The conclusion. I worked at the Max Planck Institute before and we said compassion is a muscle which you can train and it can be trained. So there's a neuroplasticity and there's also a relational plasticity. Relationships can change and they can be redesigned as a cause and they can transfer and transmit stress and burnout. But they can also contribute towards development and learning. Designing this relationship requires an attitude in modification of mindfulness and compassion as we just saw it. And in order to make this work, we need a structural and cultural support in the implementation. Otherwise, this learning process and this switch from reprimanding to presenting one's own limits from remaining in stress to I do not reach the child, how can I get there? Otherwise, this process cannot take place. It needs a holding space, so to speak, in order to achieve this shift. Well, thank you. Thank you so much to the two of you. I'm always happy listening. And if I hear, yes, it has an effect and we can make a difference together. And this makes me happy and glad. Thank you, happy, thank you. Now, fortunately, we are not yet at the end because we continue in the embassy. And you are going to say a few words about this. May I say one sentence before? We have many beautiful postcards with this magnificent yellow and we have several flyers outside. So we brought quite a lot and please feel free to take a lot with you and please distribute them and you will also find them um, at the reception in the embassy. Thank you. And this was the perfect transfer. The flyers are on the same desk where you can also find the many interesting books. Our partner 
uh, bookstore Pankebuch is happy to welcome you and you know Christmas is coming so just go and shop a gift and Christmas present so if you do it now you have more time for empathy at school or other passions otherwise as mentioned we will be delighted if many of you as many as possible of you will accompany us to the Danish embassy just across the courtyard and um, fantastic food waits for you and beverages and drinks our interns uh, will intercept any refugees so and you do not have to endure the full hours until seven o'clock just enjoy a snack and have a chat and then we will accompany you back outside accompany you and this is important and this is very important to know we have to pass a security lock in order to get into the danish embassy and therefore i would ask you just wait at the stairs and then the security colleagues will open the locks so we can jointly move over and if there's still some cleaning up work we can also go back and bring a second group over and please remember all the items your coats bags and so forth take them with you this will make the process easier okay that was the question And please remember when you walk over, please wear your badge visibly because in this way we can check that you are registered. And then we will be happy and can only say we look forward to many good talks. And thank you very much for this fantastic event. Thank you very much. Thank you to all of you. So let's get started and talk to each other. So enjoy your food and drinks, but also talk. <laughs>